Why not to mess with prices? Welcome to another episode of Understanding the Potential of Bitcoin according to Dr. Seyfedin Amuz. Dr. Amuz is a professor for economics in Lebanon and he has written this book, The Bitcoin Standard, The Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking. And this book has really influenced my thinking about a lot of things and therefore I thought, well, why not start this series and get into a conversation with you guys. In this chapter of the book, chapter six, he talks about capitalism's information system. And he says, well, you can use money as a medium of exchange, you can use it as a store of value, but money's third very important property is that it functions as a unit of account. That means money gives you a fixed frame of reference with which to compare the value of different objects to one another. That means if you have the same currency in an economy, you can on a sudden do economic planning, economic calculations, because you know what stuff is worth in relation to something else, because everybody is use, using the same unit of account. But how in an economy do you actually know what's going on um, in the economy? What are the market conditions? What are the realities? Is there, are there shortages somewhere? Is uh, the market going up? Is it going down? Like what's going on? Are people having uh, a good time uh, building this business or whatever? And he says there is actually no way to know that because the knowledge of economic conditions is by its very nature distributed. So the knowledge you cannot have, no single party can have all the knowledge. But we need knowledge in order to make decisions about how much we produce and what we want to create. So how do we get this knowledge? And he says, well, in a free market economic system, prices are knowledge and the signals that communicate information. He says the prices in an economy are the knowledge you need. You don't need anything else. Why is that? Because they carry in them the distillation of all market conditions and realities and they carry them into, in themselves into one actionable variable. So I, I thought that was very fascinating to think about prices in that way, that they are the distilled uh, market conditions and realities into one actionable variable. And therefore, all you need to know basically is price and um, the power of prices uh, is that it's a great method of communicating knowledge in an economy. You can already imagine that therefore it's not good to mess with prices, um, but uh, you need to know um, how much you want to produce and you can actually do that if you have a uh, variable that tells you what's going on in the economy and the prices reflect the market conditions. Therefore, um, Dr. Amuz is very much against capital market socialism, which tries to mess with prices. He says the problem is with planning, that would be either you have, uh, uh, how does he say, um, either you have prices as ways of allocating capital and making production decisions or you have planning, right? Like you, how do you do it? Capital allocation and making production decisions. Either somebody tells you this is what's gonna happen, planning, or you have prices. And he says the problem with somebody planning that, like in socialism, um, is that um, you have nothing that actually reflects the relative supply and demand going on right now. It is basically just some committee trying to decide what is the relative supply and demand. How does that affect you as a producer? Well, you have no way to rationally know how much to produce because you just know that information that some committee is giving to you. But then if you produce according to that, something happens and that always happens in socialism. You have huge shortages of certain goods and you have huge surpluses of certain goods. So that is what happens when you mess with price. And he says the same thing is basically going on right now in our economy, um, that governments and uh, banks are messing with price as a communication method by changing interest rates and therefore changing the price. And uh, he, can, uh, he, he only says that there would be no need to do that 
uh, if you have a different mindset uh, about economy, but if you think you have to plan in order to help people to do a good job with how much to lend and how much to um, borrow, uh, then you get to that point making those very faulty decisions. He gets to the next point, which I thought was very interesting, saying that business cycles and financial crises as we know them, and they are very normal for us, that we know, well, economies, they go through a phase and then they go down, bear market, and they go through a recession, then they go up again, bull market, everyone's happy, and those are just the normal business cycles, as we call it. He says, well, this is actually a very new thing. This whole business cycle thing doesn't have to be there and it's connected to um, messing with the price and uh, messing with interest rates and central planning. And of course, uh, recessions and um, uh, business cycles are always connected to uh, unemployment rates. And he has a very interesting statistic on page 120. He shows the unemployment rate in Switzerland and he shows that basically the unemployment rate had always been practically zero, virtually never exceeding 1% um, starting uh, um, in 1955 uh, in, in, this, uh, in this chart. And then all of a sudden you have a rise uh, of unemployment rate to 5% within only a few years. And he says this is when the Swiss economy uh, changed from the gold standard to a centrally planned um, central bank economy. He then comes to talk about a very influential book connected to all this price management and uh, how we can affect interest rates in order to uh, help the economy. And it is the book, The Monetary History of the United States by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. And he says this is one of the most important books. It's uh, 888 pages, so a big one. And it is a historical walkthrough and basically says that governments need to help in certain situations in order to uh, help uh, the economy. And of course, the Great Depression is a big topic of the book. He has some other um, top, uh, other uh, theses about why the Great Depression happened. And he asks some very interesting questions. He, for example, asks to the book, why is there no comparison of the 1920 and the 1929 depression? Uh, because you can actually learn a lot why the 1929 depression happened if you looked at the former one. Um, and it's interesting that the former one, uh, 1920, didn't last long, even though the Fed, so the Federal Reserve, they did not intervene in the way the authors recommend. So all of a sudden you have an example because they say, well, the Fed should intervene and then they can help. But in the 1920 um, recession, they didn't do that and it didn't last very long. Second question he poses is, why is it that the United States had never suffered a financial crisis in the 19th century during the period when there was no central bank? Except in the two instances when Congress had directed the Treasury to act like a central bank during the Civil War and in 1890 after the monetization of silver. So that is a very interesting question. No financial crises in the 19th century, although they had no central bank. And then first and most uh, tellingly, how did the United States manage one of its longest periods of sustained economic growth without any financial crisis between 1873 and 1890, when there was no central bank at all and the money supply was restricted and the price level continued to drop. So you had a deflationary time, but you had no financial crisis. So he basically says all the main points of the book are faulty because they are not asking the right question. Um, in the end of the book, he is then uh, again talking about the foreign exchange market uh, with a, uh, how much is it? It's an incredible number. It's like every day there is uh, 5.1 trillion um, exchanged on the foreign exchange market. And that goes back to the unit of account question. Why do we have all these national currencies and all of that problem that comes with it? Um, not only because of calculating 
uh, difficulties, but also because whole businesses can just go out of business because something changes in the value of the currency of another country, which is very sad. So um, this is basically the point of this chapter. <laughs> very quickly summarized, don't mess with prices. Let prices develop and uh, let them give you the information that you need. There is no need for a central bank to actually uh, mess with interest rates and to do central banking and to come in and help and therefore cause business cycles that we didn't have before. I think this is another very strong like foundational point in order to then later understand why Bitcoin could go in a very, very different direction uh, solving a lot of these problems. All right, this was chapter six of the book, part seven of the series. I hope you enjoyed it and let me know in the comments what you think. Bye-bye.